So today I'm going to talk about a study that I did during the summer. Um, I traveled to Zambia and uh, conducted a survey to assess uh, post-harvest losses in sweet potatoes. So this is a <coughs> preliminary study to a bigger study that we hope to do um, beginning this March. As I say, as, as, as has been said, my name is Kalenga Banda and I'm a PhD student in horticultural science and my supervisor is Chris Watkins. So just going through the outline of the presentation, um, firstly, before I go there, I would like to say uh, this data is, very, is, very, is at the very beginning of the, of the analysis. So your input, your observations, your suggestions is very welcome. And I was also just um, uh, saying um, a minute ago that I am not, this is the first time I'm dealing with qualitative data. I'm more familiar with quantitative data in the lab. And then I decided to go out in the field. So um, it's been a bit of a, a, a difficult uh, path for me. So suggestions are welcome. So we're going to go through the introduction. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief introduction, a brief background of sweet potato production in Zambia. And I'll contrast it a bit to what happens in the US because it's totally different. I'll also go through our objectives, then we'll move on to the methods that we used, and then results, and then we'll summarize. So feel free in the middle of the talk to interrupt me if you need clarity on anything. So I did the survey in Zambia, and that's my home country, and that map there just shows where Zambia is relative to the rest of Africa. And uh, in comparison to other countries like Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, uh, sweet potato production in Zambia is much lower, but it's increased over the years. And um, I think it's likely to increase as we go on just because um, we are coming from uh, a past where we have had um, a maize monoculture where uh, people mainly grow maize as a staple crop. But because of the droughts uh, that have been rampant in the past few years, there have been very high crop failures with, with the maize. But when it comes to sweet potato, sweet potato is favorable uh, because it's both a high energy food, which is uh, what most diets in Zambia and most, most of Africa are about high energy, but also it's very nutritious. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of work on um, orange flesh sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes that are biofortified to increase uh, vitamin A. It's also drought tolerant, so uh, there's been um, a lot of uh, a move towards diversification from the general um, um, staple crops to a wider range of crops. And I think sweet potato is a, is a very good um, candidate crop for that. Also, uh, this study focuses mainly on small scale farmers because those are the main growers of sweet potato. And because sweet potato is a low input crop, it's a very good crop for small scale farmers. And it's also known as a female crop because the majority of farmers that will grow the crop are uh, women. But there's a problem with sweet potato production when you compare it to corn or maize. We eat our corn dry. We make something like polento. So it it's usually stays for a long time. The, the dry kennels can stay for a long time. In comparison, sweet potato has very high moisture. And, um, and so it's, uh, it's susceptible to, to losses. And there's, there, there have been various estimations of losses. Someone, um, some, in literature, there, there's been a mention of up to 69% uh, loss in, 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 in the harvest, after harvest. And also up to 75% um, reduction in the market value in Ethiopia and Tanzania. You'll see from the stats there that there's a wide variation in the, in the estimate of losses or in the range of losses. This could be due to several reasons, uh, the methods that are being used to estimate and also the areas where it's being done because different uh, cultural practices around storage will affect the um, extent or the magnitude of losses. So generally looking at why, what, what the main causes of, of, of sweet potato 
losses are. We have already touched on the nature of the crop, the fact that it's, it's got a lot of moisture, but also it's a, a root crop. And like corn that you just get off the, off the plant, for the sweet potato, you actually have to dig it up from the soil. And because this is a mechanical activity, what happens is that the roots will get damaged. They will get damaged, and because of that damage, that uh, provides a pathway for bac bacterial entry into the plant and also moisture loss. And also, so, so in, in the US, they're able to store sweet potato for up to a year. That's mainly because there's also harvest injury, and I'm calling that bru bruising during harvesting as harvest injury. Because after harvest, what happens is that they put the sweet potatoes in a, in a, in a very hot and humid room for like a week to cure the potatoes. And uh, what happens in those co conditions is that the, the, the wounds on the roots seal off. Subarization takes place very quickly, and so the roots are able to uh, heal off, and then they, they, are, they can be kept longer because they're not losing as, might, as, much, as much moisture, and also they are, they are not um, open to infection. But this is different from what happens in Zambia. Now, that's a picture there of farmers in Rwanda. This is in a field of sweet potatoes, and uh, they have just harvested the first, the first picture is uh, the harvest. So just after harvest, they wash the roots and pack them in those very big sacks. So that curing uh, stage or that curing process is not there, partly because farmers do not have the, 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 the means to be able to get such conditions. So they'll pack them in those big bags, those very big sacks, um, and because of that, there's a lot of compression damage on the, on the roots. And they do that because it's mainly transported or sold in volumes. So let's say a woman goes to purchase sweet potatoes and she has to pay uh, for transport, for transportation of the bags, pay per bag. So she would rather package a lot in a bag so she can get as much as possible out, out of one bag. So, so that packaging excess packaging also causes um, losses. And there's also during transportation, it's transpo uh, the roots are transported over very long distances. Like in our study, they were being transported about 500 kilometers to the markets. So during transportation, if the, ba the cars or the trucks or wherever it is that they, 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 they pack them in, are very, they are tightly packed, and so there's a lot of, uh, of bruising damage. And then also the markets. And like here, where most of the produce will go to a store where temperatures are regulated, most of the um, uh, sweet potatoes or other staples will be sold in the open markets. Uh, and so there, there's no control of um, temperature or relative humidity or, or just general sanitation conditions. So uh, there's a lot of exposure to um, um, decay. So with that background, I'll go into the objectives. So generally for our study, we wanted to look at five things. We wanted to assess the magnitude of the losses, and these are quantitative losses. So sweet potato losses um, can be categorized into three um, sections or parts. So there's Qualitative loss, which is just a loss in quality, nutritional quality, and general overview of the quality of the product. And that's a bit more difficult to assess. But quantitative losses are physical loss where a product is spoiled and it can no longer be used, and so it's thrown out. So the quantity of the product reduces because it's discarded. And then there's economic losses that stem from both qualitative and quantitative losses. So in our study, we were interested in looking at quantitative losses at the household level, at the farm level. So when you're doing uh, post-harvest or after har assessment of losses after harvest, there are different phases or various phases of the value chain that you would be interested in. There's the farm gate, the household level, the farm level where the produce is being produced. Sometimes there's long-term storage there. There's interim storage before it's taken to the market. 
There's also, um, you can assess losses while the produce is in transit. You can assess, uh, assess losses while the product has gone to the wholesale market and then at the retail market. In this case, we were more interested at the household level just because it's, um, it was cheaper. We felt it would, it would be a cheaper uh, option and, and it would suffice for the kind of data that we were, lo we were looking for. Another thing we're lo interested in knowing is what are some of the cultural and storage practices or methods that are used and how do these affect losses. We also wanted to uh, find out about cultivar variations and how they affect losses. Do different cultivars um, um, rot or get damaged easily, more easily than others? And then um, we also wanted to look at what are the specific causes of the losses in the specific sites that we were looking at. And just overall perception of the importance of losses to our target farmers. So we sampled three sites, and that's just a map of my country, Zambia, where we did the study from. So we did it in three uh, provinces. We, we did it in northwestern Copper Belt and Central Province. And we, some, we picked two districts, more like provincial centers, uh, to do the study. And those are marked. Uh, there's one there in marked in blue, Solwezi, the other one marked in green, Mpongwe, and Kapirimposhi in red. And the reason why we selected those sites are one, from the graph there, sweet potato uh, expected sales. Um, the output in terms of cells is much higher in those particular areas in those provinces. So we felt we could get a, rep a good representation of farmers who were growing a significant amount of potatoes. And also uh, from the dollar side there that I put, those sites or places are very close to the main markets or the main informal markets where the produce goes after after the farm. Goodness, what happened? <laughs> so uh, that's a picture of, uh, you've recognized him, eh? yeah. <laughs> So that's a picture of me and my team in the field. There's uh, one guy, Axon, who was in this class last year. He's an agricultural officer in Zambia, and he was very helpful in just navigating the whole system, which I was very unfamiliar with. So we went together on the study. So like I was saying, we sampled three provinces purposely because of the levels of production and then working with the camp officers who are the ones in charge of certain agricultural zones. Then we're able to identify camps. Camps are simply an aggregate of villages that can range in number anywhere from 10 to 50 and they are arranged in different geographical lo locations just for administrative purposes. So we purposely selected three of those. We worked with the extension officer and targeted those that had high output. And then we randomly selected or set out to randomly select 24 farmers out of each camp to bring a total of 72 uh, farmers per district. And uh, 316 farmers in total. You'll see later in the study that this is not exactly what we got. So just to define a few things about this study. Um, I've already talked about the target population, the fact that we were targeting smallholder farmers. And uh, smallholder farmers are farmers that grow staple crops. They will grow staple crops mainly for food, and any excess then will be sold. They mainly use farm, there's no mechanization, so they'll mainly use uh, farm labor, family labor, and also drought power animals if, if any is available. They usually have a hectareage of less than five hectares, and they also have very uh, little access to inputs, uh, fertilizers or pesticides. This study was also limited to produce, sweet potato produce that was from the uh, previous season, 2017 to 2018, because our, our growing seasons in Zambia uh, um, overlap between two years. They run from uh, November to March, I think. And then we were also 
interested specifically in fresh sweet potatoes, and this assessment was being done at the farm level. And we defined uh, quantitative post-harvest loss according to the way um, uh, FAO and also um, um, Anyway, according to how FAO de defines post-harvest uh, losses, and this is that it's the proportion of total harvested produce, sweet potatoes in this case, that is physically discarded because it is considered unsafe for consumption both for humans and also for uh, and also animals because of a number of reasons. It could be decay, insect damage, harvest injury. And this uh, data collection we used paper-based uh, questionnaires, and they were semi-structured, and we administered the interviews uh, orally in, in the local language, and this questionnaire was pre-tested um, in a different site before the actual survey was done. So that's a picture of me with a farmer who looks uninterested <laughs> uh, yeah, during the interview. And this was in, I think, um, Mpongwe. So just a few uh, demographics. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize it. Oh, it's not so small there. So uh, generally, um, we had set out to get 72 farmers from each site, but that wasn't the case. So our first site, the first site we went to was Solwezi. And we didn't meet the target. So we had a specific number of days that we were spending there. So we missed that target by 10. And then we moved on to Mpongwe. And what happened in Mpongwe is that the farmers heard that there were some visitors who had come from the city. And usually at the time that we, were, we went, uh, in Zambia there's a prog program uh, where they subsidize um, inputs for farmers. So anyone who comes in from Ministry of Agriculture or anyone is, 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 um, is thought as coming to come and recruit people to give inputs to. So we had more people than we had sampled and they came and, and they didn't want to go without being interviewed. So we ended up interviewing them, which is a good thing because when we went to Kapiri, which is more like in the urban area, we didn't find the people that we had sampled because some of them had gone to the city to sell produce. And they are a bit more, you know, people in the very rural areas are a bit more um, willing rather than in the more urban areas to take part in, in such studies. So we ended up with a total sample size of 186 as opposed to our target 216. And uh, the majority of our respondents, over 50% was, was female, and this is to reemphasize the fact that sweet potato is mainly grown by women and it's called a female crop. Even when you're interviewing the farmers and you ask them, so oh, did you, a male farmer, did you sell the pr produce? Their response would be, no, I didn't, I didn't sell. My wife sold it. It's not my crop, it's her crop. So, so you can tell from there that it is a crop that is... Um, that is favored by women. And then uh, that uh, pie chart shows just the counts of the ages uh, by age of the respondents. And we had uh, a majority of them being over 45 years old. And then uh, I'll now go in and look at some of the cultural and storage practices because we were interested in finding out what are some of the cultural and storage practices in our study sites and how do they affect storage. And so uh, that pie chart there shows uh, harvest methods. So what happens is that um, instead of the normal uh, once of harvest, your produce is ready, you go in and you harvest, what we, found, or what we found is that most of the farmers will not harvest their produce all at once. They'll go in over a period of up to three months or even 20 weeks 
they will go in and harvest the, the produce slowly. And this is called piecemeal harvesting. This is mainly done because they have no form of storage of the produce and they feel that once it's left in the ground, it stays longer. Which is not always the case because as it gets drier, there's a lot of weevil damage that happens. But I guess what you can't see can't hurt you. The roots are in the ground. They can't see them, so they don't know what is happening. They do know when they eventually go and harvest. But also, apart from um, being attacked by weevils and, and, and rodents, what happens is that some of the produce is stolen because sometimes the farm is far away from the homestead, so some of the produce is, 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 is stolen. But, uh, and, and also, uh, but the, it's, the practice is also desired because it's a way of preserving the seed. One of the things that was highlighted during the study is that the farmers have no access to seed. So in sweet potato, you grow the potato from the vine. You don't plant an actual seed, you grow it from the vine. So it's much harder to keep the vine because it has to be fresh. And so farmers struggle with finding vines every planting season. So most of them will opt to leave them in the field so that when the rains come, then the, the potatoes that were left over in the field can sprout again and then they can get um, the new vines. But overall, this practice reduces the amount of yield. But most importantly, it made my job, our job difficult because then we could not ascertain how much they were losing because they were not storing. From our definition of post-harvest loss, it's loss after harvest. So because they were not harvesting their produce, it was in the ground, we could not know how much. We, we did ask them how much they thought they lost because of the practice. And we have estimates of that, very wide estimates. But that doesn't really answer our question. So this is the first obstacle, and it was a major obstacle that we had. And then, because they don't harvest all their produce, they only get what they need for sale or to eat. You find that uh, when we try to find out the type of storage or how they store their produce, out of all the respondents, we found 136 um, of, of the responses said they mainly they store using piecemeal, and piecemeal is this practice of leaving the, the, the roots in the ground and, and harvesting them slowly. Some of them will combine, they'll have their produce in the ground and harvest it slowly, but they also harvest some of it and dry it off, and so you find that some of the respondents who, who answered that they store with piecemeal also use the other methods. And the other methods that came out from the study is some people will harvest all their produce uh, dig a pit, line it with ash, and then layer it with uh, uh, sweet potatoes, an alternate layer of ash and, and sweet potatoes, and then bury, bury the roots. And the data is not presented here, but those type of storage presented very high loss, losses. And then some of them will just get what's enough to, to eat and maybe store them in their, in their homes, uh, some of them, their roofs are thatched, so they'll put them on the ground and, and they'll be kept a bit cool, cool that way. But generally, the main type of, uh, of, uh, of storage was piecemeal, which made things difficult for us still, because out of 186 respondents, I don't think you can get um, uh, a proper estimate if you just used the few the, the, the few, the, 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 the few respondents that said they used alternate uh, uh, methods. So that was a challenge for us. Another challenge that we had or something that we noticed, because we had wanted to relate what is the effect of the type of cultivar on storage. Does cultivar A uh, store better than cultivar B? So when we went in, out of uh, all the three districts, we got Three, the 21 different names of cultivars. And those names are not because they're 21 different cultivars, no. It's because they are different even from house to house. If someone thinks a certain cultivar is sweet, they'll start calling them by that description. So when you ask them, what did you grow? Then they'll call it the sweet one. 
or the Mili one or something. So, so, and, and also the names are different from language to language. We have 72 dialects. So you find one name, a name of a cultivar is different. In, in, so like when we went to Solwezi, we found a cultivar called Chingovwa. And then when we, went, when we went to Kapiri, we found a, a cultivar called Solwezi. When we investigated further, it's the same cultivar. And it's just called different names in different places. So it was very difficult then to use that data to be able to, already we didn't have enough estimates of losses and then to, to use that data to be able to, to uh, answer the cultivar specific losses was a challenge. So uh, something that worked a bit better or well is that we used a ranking system. Uh, we identified the main causes of losses um, in sweet potato from literature. And these are, I've already spoken about harvest injury, which will then cause shriveling. It will also, there's also sprouting that stems from harvest injury. And there's general decay and pest damage. So then we asked the respondents how they would rank those relative to each other. So I would, we would ask them, what is most important to you among these? Or just have a general discussion and hear what they deem as the biggest problem or the biggest challenge or the biggest cause of losses. So three, the number three or the rank three was indifferent, neither here nor there. And then one, one was uh, not a problem and five, a very big problem. That's the, that's the range that, 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 they, that they came in. So because of the varied responses, um, we ended up with somewhat average numbers. And the varied responses were because different farmers, depending on their location, um, their general experience will perceive the losses differently. And so we divided it up by uh, provinces, by districts, and we have in the next chart there, um, I'm comparing the, the responses in terms of causes of losses according to the provinces, according to the districts, and we do find that harvest injury ranking was different in Solwezi than it was in Kapiri. It was ranked higher in Kapiri than it was in Solwezi. And that could be because Kapiri is much closer to the markets. Farmers there are interested in growing produce for sale, so they care about the aesthetic or the general appearance of the, of the potatoes more than the farmer that's in, that's in Solwezi. So I still have data that I, I, I could use to kind of separate those and, and try and find out how do women rank uh, the losses differently from men and, and things like that. And then we also tried to rank uh, how important is storage losses in comparison to other production challenges, management challenges, which included things like the need to cultivate or labor for cultivation because sweet potato growing is very intensive because the roots are grown, the vines are grown on, on, uh, on um, ridges and this is all done mechanically by hand. So production challenges in terms of land preparation, pest control and, 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 and those things. And then seed availability also was an issue and then we compared it against storage losses, market challenges, and also the general low yields. And we found that manage, management, um, seed availability, and storage all were things that, that were very were highly ranked. And then we went further still to try and see how they're different across uh, the provinces. And you can see there that you have your um, Solwezi being highly ranked for uh, storage losses. That's um, partly because they have a, lo a lot of um, pest damage um, from, um, yeah, a lot of pest damage. So coming towards the end or to the end, um, 
generally from this study, we found that uh, piecemeal was the main storage method that was used, and this made uh, it difficult for us to estimate the losses, and also because the farmers didn't know the specific cultivars or the identity of the specific cultivars, it was very difficult to relate the losses to the types of cultivars. So for future studies to assess losses, you see in this study, I do not have any estimate of what was what, how much was lost. I suggest that for future studies, instead of just interviews, I think it would be better to um, combine, first of all, to have a very large sample so that then you get a lot more responses of what the losses were, and also to have uh, interviews combined with actual sampling. This is where someone can follow the process the whole way from, from the farm gate until uh, the market and see, kind of have, have a sample that you follow through and see how much is, 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 is being lost. And from this work, we are going to uh, build on a study where we're going to assess the storage potential of sweet potato cultivars um, in Zambia. Uh, I would like to thank Cows for the Away Travel Grant. I also um, got the Bradfield Research Fund that I used in this study, and also part of some funds from the Kaha Fellowship, and also um, my supervisor, and also my research assistants. One of them, my dad, is right here <laughs> in the audience. So thank you so much. <laughs> Questions? some sense of uh, what proportion of the, the crop was marketed and what proportion was uh, uh, consumed within the households of the respondents? I do have I do have that data. Like I said, I'm in the early stages of of, of, of analyzing. I actually do have how much was was, but it, it varied really. It varied from farmer to farmer and also the proximity to the market. The farmers that were closer to the market wanted to sell the, a bulk of their produce. So I had responses like 90%. So the way we did this, some farmers can't remember how much they, 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 they produced. So we kind of just used um, aids. Get 10 rocks and tell them, imagine this is your produce. How much of this do you think you sold and how much did you keep? So I do have that data and it varies anywhere from, from 90% sold, 10% eaten to the opposite. Yeah. Okay, I just wondered during that piecemeal harvest mm -hmm. period of two or three months, whether market prices uh, fluctuated much or whether they were fairly stable. They do fluctuate, I think. They do, they do, they do fluctuate. And um, they, they do fluctuate, but I think the nature of most of these um, farmers, especially the ones that will do piecemeal, is that they cannot get uh, the, the market to market their, 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 the market to, to dispose of their produce. So the main ones who do that piecemeal are people who naturally do not sell. Or they will harvest part of it, sell it, and then have the rest for piecemeal. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, do you know if there's a difference between the amount consumed at home and um, amount sold between white potatoes and orange potatoes? Um, between white sweet potatoes, there, there, there are not a lot of, um, so like I said, the problem that the farmers have is seed. So there were very few farmers that we encountered that, that had the orange sweet potato. And also on the market, it's not yet very common on the Zambian market. One problem with the orange sweet potato is that it's not as starchy. Most of them are not as starchy as the white ones. And people generally in Zambia will prefer the more starchy ones, although they are becoming a bit more aware of, of health and things like that. But it's not a lot on the market. But when it's there, I hear it even fetches a, a, a higher price because it goes to a certain class of, 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 of customers that know the value of that particular particular crop. 
particular. Yeah. So I can't comment much on, on whether they sold more of the orange because there were very few of my respondents who actually had the orange um, root. I hope I've answered your question. So I have a good question. I, I understand that you're saying that um, the ability to determine post-harvest is only after you harvest it. Yes. But because you have so much of this piecemeal operation, would it make sense to um, actually go get a farmer to agree with you uh, to go and actually sample yourself what the, what potential losses could occur of a certain number, you know, the more farm you have, you can maybe harvest two or three plants uh, per farm and determine that and then do that over many, many farms and get some idea of the potential for loss as opposed to actual loss. Yeah, I think it's possible to do that. Um, there, there would be uh, variations as you would need to define when or at what stage, or after how long during piecemeal you do that because the further along you leave it, the more losses you, so that when you say the estimate of that loss, you, it's in reference to a particular stage right. during that piecemeal. Right. But also that's something that we did because we came away feeling like oh, we are not getting the data that we want. So we kind of readjusted and started asking them. The farmers know the length of the, of, the, of the mound and how much they're expecting, especially those ones that sell their produce. They're very conscious about how much they're getting. So we did ask questions like, in that, how long did you leave it on piecemeal? 20 weeks. During that period, how much did you lose? I can't tell. Okay, when you plant seven rows, how much typically do you get? Then they would say, so how much do you think you lost in this case that you left it? So I have those estimates. And those are the ones that I, w I would not define them as post-harvest, but maybe losses due to piecemeal storage or, or some things. Potential. Yes, potential loss. Yes, or yeah. So th that data is, is there. I just maybe did a bit of confidence to, <laughs> to, to, to value it or to look at it as, yeah. Questions, guys. I want questions. I want to make my paper better. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. I noticed that uh, decay, or you were talking about how decay and um, storage issues, pest issues, were some of the main reasons that you were seeing loss at all. And did you notice that there were any solutions that farmers had to mitigate these problems, and which solutions, in your opinion, worked the best? So the, the, the one of the big problem that they have is uh, a, a rodent, they call Mfuko. And uh, that rodent goes in and immediately because when the, when, when the roots are ready, they'll crack, crack up the soil and then they'll appear. At that stage, the rodents also are aware that the roots are here and they'll go in. So especially if the land is small, it will be like competition between the farmer and, and the rodents. And what they do is that they catch those rodents and eat them. So that's one thing that, 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 that has worked. Otherwise, weevils is a very big problem that um, there's a lot of research being done trying to look for uh, cultivars that are resistant to weevils, but weevils is a, is a big problem everywhere. So that's still uh, very rampant. So on the, on the part of, of pests, there's still challenges there, and I, I do not know of any local um, uh, uh, strategies to try and reduce those, apart from harvesting everything, that that would work. But then that's also a, a challenge. But the, the, the rodents, some of them have been able to kind of, era and they also know that if you grow a small piece of land, on a small piece of land, then you have more rodents. It's better you grow on a bigger uh, size of land because then the loss from the, from the rodents won't be as significant. So those are some of the strategies that they'll use. Yes, you had a question, Dad. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, the, um, in terms of um, um, the, 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 the preservation of the crop that is uh, harvested, uh -huh. 
that which is preserved as it is, perhaps in sacks, is usually for the for sale and uh, for, for consumption. Sometimes they boil them, the roots and hang them in the sun for later use for their own consumption. Yeah. I don't know how to use that. Yeah, 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 that was one of the, sto thank you. That was one of the storage methods that we highlighted. But the general consumption patterns are people want the fresh roots. So that's why there's still emphasis on trying to extend or reduce loss of the fresh roots because Zambians are very conservative in their diets. They want what they want. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, did you find any scope for modernization, means using modern technologies? Uh, to reduce the losses in harvesting and to uh, prevent the losses incurred by the insects? Uh, so, um, my work here at Cornell looks at extending the storage life of sweet potatoes and I, I, I have kind of taken an approach where I, because I have access to, sto to modern technologies here, I have uh, I do studies on trying to extend life using different, um, I'm not working on insect, I'm not an insect person, so definitely I'm not working on insects. But there are technologies that are in use here. You know, things like um, losses because of loss, weight, weight, weight loss and things like that. They, 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 they are not a challenge here just because produce is stored at the right temperature. But that's not practical when you go to a rural area in Zambia because the farmer that is growing sweet potato is not a rich farmer. And so they cannot access uh, those storage technologies. But there are some local technologies that could be harnessed. So if we identified that storage, the specific problems in the storage that are there, we could potentially look for local solutions that could address those, those problems. So definitely um, modern technologies are not kind of not feasible because the farmers are not yet at that level. But I think the way to go is try and use some of the techniques that they use or the local solutions to the problems. Because sweet potato, potato is not considered, it's a very important crop because in, in, in cases of famine, it's, 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 it's the difference between life and death. But it's not a high value crop that a farmer, small farmer will invest in as much as they will invest in, in, in corn where they will get a certain amount of a higher, in, a higher income per, per tonnage. I don't know if I've answered your question. Somewhat. <laughs> yeah, I think if you actually be willing to expand a little bit more on corn, because we actually had a speaker named Johannes Pelkia who did uh, research on improved seed for corn mm -hmm. and results on reducing the reef and deforestation in certain places in Zambia. Is sweet potato grown in rotation? Is it grown, how does it compare in the numbers of either acreage grown in and total amounts produced when compared to corn? So we, we did, uh, um, corn is grown a lot more. Sweet potato, typically the area of land allocated for sweet potato is anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of the total land area. And so in comparison, it's much, much lower. And also, it's left to the women. And we have issues to access to land. Women don't have as much access to land or even resources as men. So obviously, their output will not be as high as. And also, the country has a program where the Food Reserve Agency of the country buys corn from farmers. So that's an incentive to grow corn. So it's, it's, very, it's very different uh, in terms of production. But then also, there have been, in the past season, there was a complete crop failure in terms of corn because of drought. But, but there was sweet potato because sweet potato is drought resistant. So it's different, but it, it's also, it depends really. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. Um, is there any sweet potato value addition being done in Zambia? And do, um, do farmers eat the sweet potato? Yes, 
they do eat the sweet potato leaves. It's my favorite thing to eat. So, uh, so there are different types of sweet potato leaves. So, some, some, some are grown mainly for just the leaves, and so they won't have the tubers. So they have these thin leaves. Typically, a sweet potato will have this very big, le broad leaf. But then the one for the, for the roots has the broad, broad leaf. The one for, the, for just the leaves will have the narrower ones. So they just um, they cook them like kale, like how you would do kale. Yeah. And your next question was? Yes, uh, so the, like Gabriel said, the only form of value addition that is rampant is, is where the women will take the sweet potatoes, peel them, boil them, cut them up, and then dry them, more like, like your dried fruit, so it will be very gummy and, and tough and can stay longer. Otherwise, you have other areas where there's sweet potato starch and such things, but that's not very common. It comes back to the same thing. Our diets are very conservative, so we, we don't really want to eat things that we don't want to eat. Thank you so much. Thank you.